everyone, I'm Marta Barandi and this is Unlock Ukraine and today we have um, Karlo Van Grotel who is a spokesperson of the President of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and who works in the Belgian Senate and who supports Ukraine and understands that Russian aggression is dangerous for the whole world. Thank you, Carlo, for being with us. Uh, thank you, Marta, for inviting me. I'm, I'm very honored because I know uh, how much you do and promote Ukraine for the, the Ukrainian cause, but not only the Ukrainian cause, in fact, for, for Europe. Because what is happening now in Ukraine impacts us directly. And if the Russian aggression is not stopped in Ukraine, they will be empowered to continue what they planned, what Putin has planned. We already see it in Georgia, we see it in, in Romania, in Transnistria. They will not stop. They but you, you know that. Do your colleagues know that? Most of them do, uh, but it is, the, it is easy to say, at a certain point, you get used to horror and you have the daily business and you have the problems of budget and, and, and uh, other problems that are happening in the world. And then it's easy to forget and to, to, to say, okay, we have other problems. Why always Ukraine? And, and that is why it is important what you are doing to remind what is happening, that this has, this is direct threat to our democracy. It is, it is two systems. You have two systems. Um, Kasparov uh, visited uh, the Parliamentary Assembly uh, of the Council of Europe and he said it very clearly. He's, he warned what? He was the one who warned what Putin would do in 2005. When, when did he visit? Uh, it was about three months ago mm -hmm. and it was very impressive because, well, he has a right to speak because he warned what Putin would do. He also became active politically. Uh, uh, alas, like we know in Russia, it is not a democracy. The opposition was little by little put away. Uh, they either had to flee or they were put in jail like Lavalny or they died. They were murdered, which also happened. Um, and he, he said, this is a clash of two systems and it is not like chess. That was something that, that really stuck on me. He said, it's not like chess where you can have a draw. Either they win or we win. There is no draw. And I'm afraid he's right. And what is the win? They win or we win? What, is, what, what will happen to them when we win? Well, hopefully with them, I don't want to generalize because I'm, you have the Russian people. Yeah. There are Russians who oppose this regime. Alas, most of them who oppose it had to flee or are in jail or they're silenced. Uh, and then you have the regime itself. And the question, one hoped that it's just Putin and that it's just one person, but it is a system. It is not one person. We can see it. you have weird figures like the Wagner Group, uh, but, but also the, the Russian army is behind him. Uh, you have the oligarchs who they could choose. Some of them left. Some of them died, as you know, because they opposed Putin or they lost all their companies because they, they, they were trying to help and to make Russia democratic. But most of them, they still do their business and they still earn money and they still help the produce the arms. So and it's complicity. The, so there is, I'm afraid that it's not, if Putin would disappear, I don't think it it, that immediately it could become better, it could become even worse. It could become worse, it even if, if opposition comes to that power. That is different. If the, if the, but the problem is that the opposition, it will take time because they, 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 there is no... Uh, the media in Russia are controlled by the, the... There is no free press. None inside Russia. There is uh, free press with Russians, but outside Russia. And they try to reach the Russians through internet. But as you know, the Russians have their own internet system, which allows them to cut uh, the links with uh, internet, like BBC World Service mm -hmm. and everything, cannot be viewed in Russia. So you only have uh, uh, one voice, you have propaganda. All the media there are, in fact, propaganda 
sides for the Russian government. Uh, yeah, you, you can see in, in uh, there are some Russian programs which sometimes you can see on Twitter what they are saying and it's almost, if you l l listen to them, it's like it, it's a lunatics. They're talking about the, 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 their, their mm -hmm. so-called uh, weapons that they will destroy the whole world. It's, it's one big propaganda and it's very difficult, of course, then as an in op uh, opposition to get your voice mm -hmm. heard. It, it but do you believe that even if opposition gets its voice heard, it would be um, easy for people to, or it, it will be very fast for people to get this views of opposition and live with that? Because, you know, for 10 years, now Russia wages war on Ukraine almost 10 years, and 10 years there is a very aggressive propaganda that the collective West is the evil, and Russia has a holy mission to liberate the whole world, or Europe at least, mm -hmm. um, from this evil uh, collective yeah, Vest things and, and all yeah. this. Not only NATO, but all the values and, you know, that values are getting uh, disrupted and so on. So Russia has a holy mission and this thing is being put in heads of children or had been for 10, I now know. the 10 years old kids, the whole generation believes that they are, uh, you know, that there is holy mission on Russians. And yeah, they it's are so now if opposition comes to power, what would, what would change? How to fill the gap? How to bridge that uh, uh, the thing to make Russia. I mean, what I'm trying to understand, and I ask it also to all our guests, mm -hmm. how would Russia's defeat look like? How is it just change of the of the system and then re-education of those kids or, or uh, filling the gap, the gap, or we see Russia as disintegrated? Uh, it could happen. Part. Disintegration could happen. But first of all, there is, of course, a battleground. What is important is that the Russians Russia may not win in Ukraine. That is essential. And, and they are not winning. Um, there are a lot of Russians that die. Uh, the the people that are drafted in the Russian army do not come from Moscow or St. Petersburg. You've seen the statistics, I think, this week. They mostly come from other regions, far from the cities, where there is a lot of poverty. And also uh, there, the, the elites in mm -hmm. Moscow then are not affected because they, their children are not fighting the war. So it's something far away, close, but same time far away, and you're not directly impacted. That's done so very consciously. They, they are genociding their own, the, the, the republics or the people of those republics. Well, apparently there are several different categories. Mm -hmm. eh? If you live in Moscow, you have probably not be drafted if you live more in, in, in closer, the, east. Far, the further you're away from Moscow, the bigger the chances that uh, uh, you, your children will be drafted and have to go uh, to the army and, and they die. And of course, I think the, 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 the reaction will come from there because at a certain point, those regions will say, okay, we are sacrificing an entire generation for what? Mm -hmm. Do you think they will ask themselves for what? If there is this propaganda saying I you are dying because of the well, holy mission of uh, I think new of children, when, when your children, when, when your children come back in, the, in, in a coffin or they're wounded. They get money for that. Yeah, and they, they, get, yeah, they get money, but, mm. but you see already there is some regions that don't want to, to work anymore, don't send drafts. Mm. There have mm. also been at a certain point protests with the draft. That is why now, because they're now apparently mobilizing again in Russia, they don't want to say it, but they, f they did some measures now, because apparently um, normally when you're drafted, they have to give you in person the paper. You have to accept it, and then you're drafted, and you have to go to the, 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 the front. But a lot of, of young Russians don't want to fight there, and they, they flee. Mm -hmm. And now they found a new system. They said, OK, you have an electronic mailbox. Every Russian citizen has that. And when we send the mail to there, you are drafted and you have to come. And if you don't come, then you will be punished. You will be thrown to mm -hmm. jail. So apparently there's a big problem, which I get, to find people to go to mm -hmm. the front because mm -hmm. they, are, they are part of it don't want to go. And especially yeah, they know the results. Uh, yeah, it would be a good uh, result if uh, the people of Russian Federation decide to fight against it inside Russia. And that has an uh, impact. That will have an impact. Hopefully, and hopefully we don't wait too long because Russia has a lot of people. Yes. Uh, so Russia is ready to send uh, uh, thousands and thousands and that hundreds of worry. thousands. And that's the thing. If they, you know, they don't have... Um, uh, nice weaponry, not, not more modern weaponry. They still have the, the old one, but they have a lot of people. And they do not respect life. 
Yes, but the thing is that we don't have that many people. I know, that is my and, worry. And their people, it's weaponry against us that we cannot combat because they have more than us. And then they're the worst people are dying. They are sending all those people from prisons. They, they liberate yes. them to, to fight against Ukrainians because then they can, uh, first of all, indoctrinate, indoctrinate them easily and they can pay them money and things like that. And these people already have the mentality to fight, um, right? And they use terroristic meth methods. Um, but uh, they have many of those mm -hmm. and their worst are dying and our best are dying. And that's the thing, how many more of our best should die well, that Russians uh, stop, that they have no well, more, that, that, they, that they are exhausted with their own That is people. exactly the reason why we need to send more, we need to arm Ukraine, that is essential, with, with modern weapons so that they can defend themselves and that they do not lose too many lives. When you say we have to arm, you mean uh, Europe or Belgium? Well, Belgium, alas, you know that uh, with the, the Iron Curtain that disappeared, we thought that we would come in a peaceful world and that uh, our army was not that necessary anymore, so we did disinvest it in defense. Uh, we only had interventions, we were mostly humanitarian. Um, so uh, our army is in a dire state. Now we are investing finally uh, in a stronger army because now we see, of course, what happens when you don't have an army. But the problem is that we cannot give that much because we don't have that much. There is, of course, we have, and that is uh, something sad, we sold at a certain point a lot of leopard tanks to a private company here in Belgium, which has a stock. Uh, uh, you maybe saw the, yeah. the pictures uh, of 100 uh, at least leopard tanks. Some of them are in good shape, some not, but part of it is. And we could buy them back. And why are we not buying them back? Because it takes money and our budget is not, and it is a political choice. It's uh, and and we have do to do that. Do you feel it's a choice. wrong political choice? Yes, mean, it's, it's a wrong, wrong political choice. So you I would like the government to do a different uh, thing and buy those tanks and send them. Well, to if Ukraine. they are, if they are in a good shape, those tanks, which apparently they are, they are needed now. You, you are dying in order to defend our democracy. We are not sending people. We have to do something. How many people are like you in the, in the Belgian politics, in Senate, in in the Parliament? Who understands that? It depends. When you ask, do we have to send something? Yes. But then in, when you ask and there should a vote, and then you have to put money on the table, it becomes difficult. And the difficulty is also because there are certain political parties who don't want to invest in arms, who say, no, you have to talk, and there need to be more in diplomatic. It's more leftist uh, parties. Uh, well. The Ecolo Green Party is more inclined not to send, and that is why, what, what did we send to Ukraine? We sent body armor, uh, we sent a few rifles, but not a lot. Uh, we sent fuel, uh, um, those things, but we mm -hmm. do not send arms, not a lot. Mm -hmm. And okay, we don't have a lot of reserve, and we need to, to buy ourselves also, you know, because our army is in, in not in, in good mm -hmm. shape, but we have things we can do like those mm -hmm. leopard tanks which are necessary now and which could be and and we don't do it and so it's a political choice and it's probably because in 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 the majority the the green ecolo and mm, that i know mm -hmm. others they don't say it loudly but but some are opposed yes and and, and, and that is a big but problem you say that money plays a role there as well well um, money is the excuse it's, it's, it's excuse. i think so it's, it's more ideologically they, 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 it's nice. I mean, in a, in a perfect world, it's 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 nice to think, oh, we do, do peace and we do, do diplomatic. But diplomacy has failed. We see it. Nobody or not a lot of people saw it coming. What Putin did. We see the horror now every day. Um, like like this week, um, I haven't looked at the the, the the videos, but there are videos circulating, and I've heard it on. on podcasts and on the news of uh, Russian soldiers and, and, and mercenaries of Wagner that are uh, killing with a little knife uh, and beheading 
uh, uh, Ukrainian soldiers, which is of course against any convention. I mean, that's obvious. But this is this is barbarian. But this, this is, is terrorist evil. Yeah, they this are using the methods of uh, of Islamic State, don't they? Yeah, just exactly. And so that is happening. And then you, you cannot say, oh, but we we should wait and and insist on peace talks. I'm sorry. I think first, Ukraine needs to have the arms to push back that evil but and then once they are pushed back out of ukraine okay then we'll have to see but but you cannot just say on the one hand oh it's terrible what happens and on the other hand just say mm, we'll send some fuel and we send some no you but can't Carlo, do that. look we are one year on Yes. This uh, full-scale uh, invasion and uh, aggression and terroristic using terroristic methods against Ukrainians and showing it to the whole world and being proud of it. Russians are proud of the things they are doing. That is and, the and the thing is that uh, now United Nations has on the head of the Security Council um, yes. uh, Russia and uh, basically Putin people who are <coughs> directly subordinated to Putin and reporting to him a person who has a warrant, an arrest warrant from International Criminal Court, the international organization that was created within the system mm -hmm. of international relations. To prevent How this. is that at all not absurd? Yes, that is a problem. And as you know, uh, Russia also has, the, is, is, has a veto. In, in so whenever in the United Nations you want to uh, put a motion against Russia or condemning Russia about the invasion, they have a right to veto. So, so terroristic state yes, has right that, to that veto. That is a problem. That is, that is Germany is not in Security Council because of the aggression it waged on, on the whole uh, Europe. And Russia, during the aggression, has not only veto power, but it has the Security Council. Yes. It's, and then we find people defending the negotiation talks. Yes, but you, you cannot negotiate while somebody is, is, is uh, uh, trying to kill you, trying to maim your people, trying to... to you, can, you cannot negotiate while you have a knife on your throat. You, how can you say, let's have peace talks? This is, uh, uh, that is the crazy thing. Because Russia says, okay, uh, we're liberating the, the Ukrainian uh, 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 regions. Eh? We're liberating. Look at those images liberating. May I ask you, you are uh, working in the Senate and you are also the spokesperson of the President of the uh, Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe. What do you do, uh, because I see you are you're very passionate about it, what do you do in your daily uh, job to spread awareness and to make sure that people know and understand the things that you are saying here? Well, um, in within, uh, uh, there are two things. Eh? So, within uh, Open VLD, that's on the national level. Um, we have s parliamentarians who are really aware of this. We have uh, drafted uh, several resolutions which, uh, in collaboration with uh, Kravchuk, uh, a Ukrainian uh, parliamentarian, uh, we, we are in close contact with her, and uh, um, we deposed several resolutions. I think, of course, one is crimes against humanity, which is obvious now. Um, and the other one, which is, I think, very important, is the demand that the Wagner Group, all associates and everybody who is involved with that should be put on the European terrorist list. Because it's one, it's one thing of symbolic, of, of condemning and saying, oh, this is bad what is happening. But that does not help. That does not help the situation on the ground. That does not help what is happening now in Ukraine. Whilst the Wagner Group, if you put them on the terrorist list, you can block, and all the people involved with it, you can block their banking accounts, you can block their transactions, you can block because they're also active in Africa, as you know. Uh, Bringing the diamonds. Uh, yes, because they, of course there is a strong arm there. They're, they're fighting in 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 there, there with fake with, with memes and, and and fake news. They are trying to turn around people in some African countries against Europe, and then they come support the government. And the first thing they do is get their hands on the mines and and everything that's worth money, 
and then it's a money-making machine and that money goes of course to Russia and then to the Wagner group in Ukraine in order to fight and that we should cut because they use transport planes they have transport planes so if a company uh, uh, works with Wagner group they should be sanctioned so that they can no longer uh, uh, bring uh, 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 arms to Africa and vice versa. How long will it take to put Wagner Group on the Well, that is, that is, as you, so it is already for, I think, three months that we're talking about it. And the Senate, and there is a The problem is the there Senate. is a procedure. So a country, yeah. you, you, a country needs to say, okay, I want this to happen. And then there's a judicial procedure. And alas, that takes time. And that is the problem. Uh, because it's, it's obvious what is happening, but you need a judge that allows it. That's how the procedure is. And that takes time and that is very frustrating because time, as you said, we, you need to act quickly because Russia can afford the luxury to take their time because they do not look at human lives. If they lose a million people, they don't care. Ukraine cares for the life of their people. They cannot afford to lose a million people, especially on the front. And so they're playing... We, Time is on their side and we must move more swiftly and alas, it always takes a lot of time. And there, so there the resolution, there is no resolution in the Senate? On, uh, there is a resolution But it's in not the adopted, Senate. it's being it's negotiated. It's now in procedure, mm -hmm. it, it will soon hopefully be adopted. All the parties support it. Huh? There, at All the least, parties support it? Yes, that is the good thing. At least there... Uh, 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 we, so it, it should go quickly. Maybe a tricky question. Um, so if Wagner is, if Belgium takes a lead, let's say, in putting Wagner's uh, group on the list of the uh, Europe, European list uh, mm -hmm. of the terrorist uh, organizations, and then it succeeds, so the Wagner group cannot bring diamonds anymore and cannot help with diamonds, would that, uh, would, would that, um, no, that impact Belgium? Well, seen that Belgium is the I country that blocks getting, I this see where you're getting at. It's, it, it, um, uh, no, normally, the Belgian diamond business uh, does not uh, accept blood diamonds. We know that sometimes it's difficult to trace. They're working on a better tracing system. Uh, but it is a problem because you have uh, um, also diamonds from the bears that comes from Russia. Russia is one of the biggest producers of diamonds um, and Belgium is still uh, buying, but Belgium uh, companies are still uh, buying them and spreading them and it, you directly or indirectly help the Russian state yes. and thus the, the and, and then the question is what should you do? Should you stop it or not? Now I know that uh, there is a proposition and they're working on that to do a strict, because the problem is traceability. Yeah? With the diamond, it's very difficult to see is it the Russian diamond or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is the problem. And they're working on that, but there again, they're working on that, mm -hmm. and they're working on a plan, but in the meantime, still doing business. The, the same thing with the liquefied gas. Uh, Europe is no longer, uh, we solved the pipelines, we don't, no longer are uh, buying uh, gas from Russia directly from mm -hmm. the, the, the pipelines because they're blown up. Uh, but we're still buying a lot of liquefied gas. In fact, it has gone up. Uh, and every day, Russia uh, earns 800 million. That's the number on gas. And the main hub for liquefied gas that comes from Russia is in Belgium. Isn't it uh, a bit of a double standard, like uh, uh, talking about the... Um expensive weaponry and uh, not sending weapons to Ukraine because of expenses, and at whatever, the at the same time, earning, paying, money. earning money on Russia and, and paying for the war in Ukraine, basically indirectly paying for the war in Ukraine. Yes, it is a problem. Uh, it's hypocrisy, isn't it? Hypocrisy. The, the, with the diamonds, there is one problem. Now, Belgium could say, okay, we stop buying that. We could do that. But the problem is that Dubai will continue buying them. It will just, a diamond is very easily, it's not big. It's with transport, the diamond, it can easily go to Dubai and then we spread around. And so you, when you use sanctions, you must look at, do the sanctions reach the target, which is that Russia gets less money. And here it, it wouldn't affect so it would not Russia. Impact, it would impact Belgium. Because they, it would impact Belgium a lot. 
but it wouldn't affect Russia because they would, it's, it's much easier to, to fly diamonds instead of to Antwerp to fly them to Dubai than with oil to suddenly change with oil or with gas. That is a problem. So, but you're right. Um, it's not, not always black and white and it's not always easy. And it is, it is a problem. And I think we should, uh, on the diamonds, since the, the Antwerp Diamond Board is working at the system of traceability, well, you should put a time limit on it. I think we should really say, okay, if you say you can do that, we give you six months, make that system work, and then it's okay. Why not? We cannot continue to do this. I understand uh, uh, you have your economic things, you, the sanctions have to work, but you cannot co continue a system where you are supporting Russia. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, you have to choose. And, and um, so with the diamonds, I think we should put a deadline on it. Uh, the same with the liquefied gas. It is a problem. We cannot, because Flux is the company that is importing it, says, yeah, but we have a contract for 25 years, so we can't do anything. Well, that is ridiculous. We have, there are a lot of companies that had contracts. They had factories in Russia yeah. that closed. So they did it. So why can't Fluxis do it? Because it's a weird system. So the Russian gas comes to Fluxis, liquefied, then it becomes gas. And then the uh, magic happens, it becomes European gas. Belgium does not have gas fields, but then it is exported to Germany to, because it's not for Belgium mostly, it's for Germany, for other countries, for France, whatever, also part of, for, for Belgium. But it, it's, then suddenly it's European gas, but which is ridiculous. It's not, it's Russian gas. So Belgium finances um, well, Belgium. directly, indirectly Russia. Well, say like Russia, a okay, lot of yes. European countries. And now, um, like a lot of other European countries indeed. Um, and now with the nuclear, with the, with the closure of nuclear plants, it's isn't it even bigger yes. investment into well, Russia? My honest, and th th that is my opinion, uh, but a lot of, I, th I think most, it is a bit weird that we are closing nuclear essentials thus because we need the energy where does the energy come from the plan is if we close them to put gas centrals so we need gas now there are not there's a bit of gas from norway but it's not enough for all of europe mm -hmm. eh? they're already pumping at full volume so we don't have yeah, we can have shale gas from the united states but it is five times more expensive and so probably we will use liquefied gas from russia which is the main problem. So instead of uh, uh, reducing our dependence on Russian gas, we risk uh, making it bigger, which is a bit crazy. Who is pushing for that, for the closure of nuclear plants here in Belgium? Well, the, the uh, Green Party, there are, just as in Germany, the Green, well, it was decided in 2003 with the problem uh, with uh, Chernobyl and Fukushima said, oh, we have to stop nuclear energy. And then we had a, a plan of 25 years, well, about 20 years, to uh, uh, put alternatives. But the repetitive, go the, all the governments since then did not really think about the alternatives. And so now we're very close to the deadline. We are closing nuclear centrals. We are the only country that is closing nuclear centrals in Europe with Germany. Other European countries realize that they need more nuclear energy. Netherlands is uh, uh, keeping them open and building new. France is building new. Italy, uh, Czechia, they're all. But, but, and what is the, main, the, the, the common factor in Germany and Belgium? That is that the Green Party mm -hmm. is in the majority and they are uh, st historically staunch opponents of nuclear energy. And it's a bit of a dogma and this Although now, of course, they are now forced with what happens in Ukraine to, uh, there are two Belgian nuclear centrals that maybe will be prolonged for 10 years. Yeah, because the reality was that we did not have energy at the other thing. So they're a bit stuck there, but the deal is still not done. Even those two of the five that are going to close, we're not sure for the moment, the deal is still not done and they the passed the deadline to keep them open and that's a problem because if they will all close, well, energy will have to come from something and renewable is good, mm -hmm. but it, it, we all know uh, wind and solar is, is, is not always, you don't always have the sun, you don't always have the wind. So then you need a backup energy. In the backup energy, if you don't have nuclear, it will be for the moment with the technology that we have, it will be gas and- From Russia.
Pro and then regret, regret, regret. We regret that we gave out, uh, that we gave up our nuclear power in terms of uh, nuclear we nuclear weapon. You may regret, Belgium may regret that closed down the nuclear plant. I think it is a big mistake. Carlo, uh, what is your personal background? Why you are connect? I mean, why you are so much uh, um, passionate about this Ukrainian cause and defending Ukraine? And how come you are in politics? And a little bit about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so I work for uh, Open VLD. I also um, am active in uh, a citizen network, Liberale Wereld, where we uh, defend liberalism, and so. Um, which is, so it's not, that is not political, it's just the liberal ideas we, we defend. So we support the MR, we support the Open VLD, any liberal party. Uh, so and we try to push... Of the hmm? open, it's not a part of uh, Open VLD. No, 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 it's, it's totally independent. It's, uh, it's, it's with volunteers, a bit like, like you. Uh, that is, uh, no, no, there is, uh, it's, it's uh, people put their time in it and, and try and, and see the danger of, of democracy that is under uh, pressure also in, in, in Belgium with extreme parties. That is the, the big worry. And yeah, in Europe, we also see our democracy under pressure from... And, and why the, the... With Ukraine, I'm... Uh, a uh, little bit about Open VL, VL, uh, yes. the, the, the Liberale world at Open VLD. So the difference between the network, Open yes. uh, network of the Liberale world and the political parties. Are you more amplifying what political parties are saying, or you have still a bit different stance from them? Can you uh, criticize them? Is it like we, we yes, we, we have a different stance, and sometimes we don't agree, and we try to push our point on uh, uh, the current state of affairs, which is, of course, when you're a, a political party, you have to do compromises, but sometimes you have to be careful that you don't make too much compromises and that you endanger uh, the ideas where you stand for. And, and, and that is where we as a liberal world mm -hmm. try to, to uh, influence the political parties and, and, and uh, uh, we, we sometimes differ on, on but content, your people yes. who belong to this network they are in these different parties or they are not it's, it's, uh, the most of them are not uh, uh, even member of a political party we have uh, entrepreneurs we, we have uh, uh, normal citizens who are just mm -hmm. uh, uh, liberal and and uh, but not automatically member of a political party of the liberal party and the liberal world uh, does it have ambition to become a political party uh, or not yet? No, <laughs> except if, if it's really a problem with, with uh, the, the current Liberal parties, but no, no. We, what we try to do is to, um, we have lo several opinions, opinions. We, we sometimes go get into newspapers, we push ideas. We have contact with, with politicians, being it of a mayor of Open VLD. And there, uh, uh, um, yeah, we try to push a bit the agenda of liberalism. Um, like, for example, uh, with Ukraine, uh, we are more pushing this item because we see what is happening and it is a big danger. And sometimes yeah, political parties have to make compromises and then yeah, they don't, for example, with the arms, we really think that that should be done. And, and alas, sometimes with the compromise, then they say, oh, no, we can't do it, sorry. And Ukraine, so how is uh, how did it happen that you are so uh, well, s outspoken about Ukraine? Because uh, with um, Rick Dams, who is uh, uh, as a president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, um, we, we were in contact with Ukrainian parliamentaries and, and uh, Russia was a member of that uh, European Council. There were 47 countries and Russia was a member till 2014 when they invaded mm -hmm. uh, the Crimea and they were thrown out, which was logical. I mean, it, it, the, the Council of Europe is uh, main aim is to defend human rights and democracy. So invading another country is not exactly... Uh, uh, How you defend uh, human rights. Yeah. So they were thrown out, which was logical. Yeah. But then something weird happened. After uh, a few years, there was a pressure that Russia should come back 
from countries diplomatically because you need to open the diplomatic dialogue, you need to talk with Russia, and when you keep them in the Council, also the European Court uh, can help with human rights in Russia, which was a bit weird because, if as Russia you know, implement now Putin said that he would decide, yes. they would decide which, uh, what Decisions they would accept and not of the European Court. So that, that was yeah. not an argument, but that was the argument that was made. And, and to my surprise, they were allowed back. But who, who helped them? Is there someone from Belgium who helped them to come back? No, but there was, well, not, 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 you cannot put a face on it, but there were, let's say that the l a majority of European countries clearly they pushed for it. Uh, pushed for it. Uh, they thought that it was uh, uh, necessary to open the dialogue. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I remember, so the, the, they were allowed back in, in the European Council and there were then deputies from the Duma that uh, were there. And then they were just back the first day and there was a Latvian parliamentarian and there was a Russian parliamentarian from the Duma who passed him and he recognized him. Mm -hmm. And he suddenly went to the Latvian parliamentarian and it was, everybody could see it. And he started, he was physically very big, the Russian. And he started attacking the Latvian parliamentarian and say, wait till I get to you. He was threatening him just bluntly in the open with, with everybody looking at it, there were even cameras. And then he realized, what is this? What is this country? These are representatives. With whom you so wanted to negotiate, not you. Yeah, but the, yeah. The, the, the and then we, we, let, we, we, we let evil back in. This is, mm. We did not put any conditions. We, we just, oh, the diplomatic, and of course now, yeah, now they're thrown out again. If I remember right, it was uh, Petra de Suter who made the report on, uh, on Russia coming back. And because also, as you say, that the Greens have this uh, position of peace and peaceful talks. and uh, They believe in, in, in diplomacy. And of course, diplomacy sometimes uh, is, is important. Eh? You, have, you have several means of, of, of trying to find a solution internationally. But of course, diplomacy only works still a certain point yeah. when when the the other country decides okay uh, i invade and i don't care yeah can you negotiate or di have be diplomatic with people who came to kill you That's well now we know the answer eh? we thought we could do it and we see what happened alas we we, we russia was accepted back in the international community uh, putin uh, uh, was allowed back at the table with with all the international leaders uh, and Crimea was a bit forgotten. Uh, and we thought, okay, it's settled, all is well. Um, and that is not the first time, because it's, Russia did it several times. They, it, it started with the, the Chechnya, uh, we all forget. Absolutely. There, uh, 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 Georgia, they know, uh, uh, Transnistria. I mean, I mean they each time they attack, and then there is a kind of an appeasement, mm -hmm. and then everything's okay, everything's and normal. And then they come again. And then they the come again, and they force. grab again, and they grab again. And now, of course, I mm -hmm. think they, 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 yeah, this, they, they passed the threshold that, no, because with, with all the atrocities now that are happening, um, I don't see how you can defend to negotiate mm -hmm. with, with a country that does this. Russia tries to wipe off Ukrainian identity uh, from, from this world. They say it publicly. They publish it. The people who are in power publish the articles and tweet it. Yeah, the culture, it, and the books, say, everything, the so language. Absolutely. So they also kidnap Ukrainian children. So they try to, uh, to wipe us off. And at the same time, uh, there are people like you who are helping Ukrainian identity to flourish in these countries, in your countries, in host countries. Um, I remember you participated also in our auction, uh, Give Life yes. to Ukraine, and uh, um, thanks to that, and also you participated in this general um, project to buy generator, industrial generator yes. for Kharkiv, for which we are very grateful, yes. and uh, uh, Kharkiv is very grateful. It uh, provides a lot of electricity for, uh, for people mm -hmm. who defend our country. Um, uh, you bought certain things, um, where do they, uh, what, what, can you share with our audience what exactly you bought and where these uh, ah, articles are now? Well, it, it was, uh, um, I, bought, um, I bought several things, but, but uh, the most important is the, the army uh, T-34 
T-shirt of the uh, well T-shirt shirt uh, that was worn by uh, a Ukrainian general who did the the biggest offensive successful since the Second World War against uh, the Russians. And uh, I thought symbolically it was very important because it gave hope. It gave hope to the Ukrainian people, of course, and also to Europe. It showed that that you can beat them because in the beginning, well, you had the invasion mm -hmm. of Russia. And you, you think, okay, the Russian army, it's huge. They will squash Ukraine. That was, everybody was convinced. I can imagine the Ukrainians when they saw these planes and everything, the, the sheer terror. But Ukraine is very courageous and they managed not only to first of all push them back of Kiev, but then start the offensive when everybody thought, oh no, that will not work. It worked. And, and so that mentally was very important because then we realized, okay, we can beat this, this evil. We must not submit to that and we can beat them. And symbolically, uh, it now hangs in, in my office uh, uh, and everybody can see it and when they ask what it is, I always explain it and why it is, it is important because it reminds also every day the sacrifice that, that uh, Ukrainians are doing. At the same time, um, there are, it happens also in Brussels that uh, we are not allowed in certain places to put Ukrainian flag, for instance. I didn't um, know that. Well, <clears throat> let's say in in certain buildings so there is rule not to put anything and then when we put Ukrainian flag they also say please remove Ukrainian flag. Okay. Do you think is that uh, something we, we should maybe raise awareness more on it because my personal belief is that at, at the time when our identity is trying uh, is being uh, under threat of mm -hmm. uh, disappearance um, in the center of democracy in the heart of democracy we have to make a place for Ukrainian identity to be manifested yes. in order to um, gap that. Uh, yes, like you're doing here. Eh? With, with, uh, but you, you did a lot uh, uh, to promote the, 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 what the Ukrainian case and what happens. And it is very important to raise that awareness because it is close by and at the same time it's not happening here. You don't see it. And so people at a certain point with the news, you get used to terror. If you see terror the whole time, you get used to it. And so people's attention goes else and, and they tend to forget, which is terrible because it is happening close by. And if the Russians win, next will be a European country and God knows where it will end. So it is important to keep, to, to show what it is that the Russians do. That is why this virtual exposition that you have here, where you can put on a mark and then you can see in the villages that and the cities that have been bombed by the Russians and especially civilians, because you see it are all apartment blocks, that it's not military bases that have been bombed. It is really houses where people lived. And, and what, what shocked me was the image of an apartment block that was half you could see the living rooms where there was still furniture and kitchens and there were people living there and they, they were blown up and half of their life is still there standing as a and it is important to remind us of that because it is it is the most important battle that is happening now between democracy and the authoritarian system is happening in Ukraine and the consequences if Ukraine loses would be devastating for democracy, for everybody. And we may not allow it. It, it can. But we, we must are a little bit allowing that. The thing is what I can share, I can share my experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, this one year, especially after Bucha, it was Ukraine was every day on the news. It was on the agenda. But now mm -hmm. closer to the European elections next year, because yes. of all these elections, we are um, putting this. Well, not yeah, we, no. we, not we, <laughs> not you and me, but no. uh, generally speaking, um, people are putting this uh, um, Ukraine issue aside. And um, while Ukraine issue goes aside, somewhere on the background. Um, Russians or pro-Russians who were quiet the whole year, silent the whole year, mm -hmm. they started to raise their heads. They started to speak up. They started to appear, and which is very dangerous. It mm -hmm. means it's a sign of us giving them space, yes. giving space to those people whom we uh, consider dangerous. 
Uh, I understand about the liberalism and so on, but there should be some... Yeah, but that, uh, because I didn't answer your question, should we push more if we're not allowed to, to put up a, a Ukrainian flag? Yes, of course, because it's freedom of expression and freedom of opinion. I mean, why? I didn't know that apparently you were not allowed at certain places to show a Ukrainian flag. That is not good. Uh, especially not even in our office, in our space, I mean, outside to put it on the windows. Yeah, which is... Which is, you which can is imagine, the Especially <laughs> here, we are in the heart of, of the European democracy. Uh, that is, I didn't know that this is a bit fiber blasting. And, and that okay. is dangerous. We consider it dangerous. Uh, why? Last week there was a demonstration near the NATO headquarters. Our demonstration uh, where we um, congratulated Finland mm -hmm. on uh, raising Finnish flag or becoming mm -hmm. a member of NATO. Uh, also, uh, there was the first commission in a few years, Ukraine-NATO uh, commission. Uh, our um, Minister of Foreign Affairs arrived, so we also mm -hmm. uh, welcomed here, uh, him here in Brussels. But after our demonstration, mm -hmm. there was another one, the demonstration of Russians. Okay. Russians first time in the one yes. year they came out, they were allowed to demonstrate there not only s come out but also sell their z signs z the which letter z is basically a fascist sign which is fascist sign which yes. is not forbidden not banned in belgium not banned in the eu yet somehow mm -hmm. and the thing is that these people used uh, permission of the police, permission of the of Belgium to do that. Use the NATO space, the he, the, the mm -hmm. uh, close to the headquarters, to be able to put it on the TAS on the uh, TAS agency, uh, the TV station. So the, the TV came yeah, to, to make it, and then of course, and then it went for back propaganda uses. So and then Russia says, "Look, even in Belgium." People are uh, supporting Speaking us and doing against... Not only supporting, they were saying that the uh, uh, US should stop the war on uh, with Russia and uh, that it's happening on Ukraine. Yes, so are we giving the space for propaganda that later well, that kills Ukraine? Uh, the problem that the, the, we have now in, in uh, the Belgium Senate, uh, uh, big report, and we're working on that with auditions already for uh, several months, and it was introduced by uh, uh, deputy of Open VLD, Kuhnkracht, and uh, there we see we are we have been and we still are very naive about propaganda means that are used uh, uh, by authoritarian states like Russia. We we think too much in boxes. Eh? We think we have in Europe we have either the uh, diplomacy, then of course you have the other side. You have war. Then you have eh? it's all different things. Whilst in, and, and that is what came out in, in, in those auditions, uh, Russia uh, looks at all those means as one. So diplomacy and army, it's all one link. Instrument of and war. And of course, you also have uh, propaganda, you have influence, true economic influence. Eh? We can see it here with, with the Russian gas, it's influence. Eh? Um, but not only economic influence, you also have influencing through social media with propaganda, with fake news, we, where they are very specialized in that. I know Ukrainians counter that very good, which with yeah. any of our citizens who do that and everything, I know. But the, they're also buying influence. We know in the past that there were, uh, and maybe still are, that is what we're looking in now, uh, uh, that there is the financing of Belgian political parties in order to defend the Russian regime. There have been uh, Belgian elected politicians who went after the uh, annexation of Crimea to the fake uh, elections, literally fake elections that Russia organized them, you know. Uh, the, and they were there as elections observers. They were invited by the Russian state. Everything was paid, of course, by the Russian state. They, because it was not an official, nobody recognized that. So they were, they, they knowingly went there. They knew that they were paid by the Russian state. And of course, why did Russia do that? Because then they legitimize that fake election. Because when they say, look, there are Belgian parliamentarians observing these elections. Look how democratic we are. So, and this all happened. We saw that and there was almost no reaction to it. And that's very, very uh, dangerous because that is a very, obvious thing. 
But there are other means by influence that are less obvious. How much financing is still going on now? That is one of the big questions we have now, and we're looking into that. Belgium is so much influenced by Russians. There are so many lobbyists. There are also a hundred and something diplomats of uh, Russia in yes, Belgium. Yes, we have a main... Do we need so many Well, that, uh, we, we have, uh, uh, at a certain point, uh, part of the Russian uh, uh, diplomats were sent away, but it was... You're perfectly right. Um, there are still enormous amount of uh, Russian diplomats. Um, you have to look here? at their embassy, it's huge. Yeah. And we all know that it is not just for the, the relations, since there are at this point not really a lot of discussions going so on. So what they do? And exactly, uh, there is uh, because uh, uh, the spying, of course, is one of their very important things. And of course, also influencing, like you say, and uh, um, it is, I think we should, of course, you keep a minimum staff, but all the rest is not necessary here and should be expelled. It is not a good idea to have them running around because I didn't know about the manifestation of, of those Pro Russians Russia, yeah. that were... Uh, but that is very bad and that is very dangerous and it is not useful. What and it is also do? important as a, a signal to Russia that, okay, we don't accept that. As long as you keep uh, a big diplomatic post here, you still are investing in the so-called dialogue, which is not happening. I mean, who, who is talking to them? So what are they doing here, in fact? You know, it becomes much harder for us to uh, to fight back. To um, it, is, it is really harder for us now to uh, defend the cause. It's harder than a year ago. After Bucha, it was much easier. It was very, of course, a very tragic um, reveal or the the well you uh, get the used thing that to but the, that's the terrible thing at a certain point you get used to horror and and so it, on the news first time you see that is oh and then say wow well, okay you know. what can we do because you know ukrainians will also get tired of being pushed back every time I mean, well, we, we don't get, I mean, there are certain people who will never get tired because they, uh, there is motivation yeah, but you, for them. You but lost, you, you personally, I know uh, that some of the people of your organization lost persons close to them. Uh, um, so, no, I understand. But, but what, what should you do? Well, you are, I know you, you are, you are uh, uh, pushing a lot and, and it's, it is essential that you keep, despite the fact that sometimes public opinion is, yeah. is distracted, uh, to put it on the agenda. How can, we, uh, how, how can I stay diplomatic while being harder? That's what I'm trying to understand. You know, for me, it's very hard yes. to at the same time say, thank you, thank you, you are so kind, everyone, and helping. So, but at the same time, pushing, either I am pushing or I am diplomatic. How can I, you know, uh, it's, stay? It's a difficult balance, I get it. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not, you should not be discouraged, first of all. Sometimes you have to be blunt. You have to ask difficult questions. Like with the diamonds you raised, it's a problem. And it's good that you ask it, it's important because, yeah, it's economically important to Belgium. It's 3% of our gross national product. But at the same time, it is not a necessity. It's not that we need diamonds. It's but they're nice, but that's it. It's not that there, there, there is a very little utility, industrial a bit, but that is just so we. But but so you should push those questions and put a mirror to to the people and say, okay, what do you want? And and do you you have to put your money where your mouth is? Sometimes you have to push a bit, and I know you do that, and and that is very good, and that is why I respect what what you do and what promote Ukraine does, because. We have been, and we still, I think there is still an inclination with, with the people, and I understand, and politicians and, and politics and European politics that, well, after a while, we'll go back to where we were and, and we will have a happy Europe and, and there will be a deal in Ukraine. It's kind of nostalgia because the alternative, which last is there? It is not by our choosing, but it is there. You, the, uh, the, Russia has done what it has done. 
It has happened. You cannot unwind it. You cannot unwind the crimes that have happened. You cannot unwind the rapes that have been done. You cannot unwind the civilians that have been killed. It has happened. Blood is all over the streets. And, and alas, as much as you would want, oh, we go back. Alas, it is gone. And it is very difficult to realize that because Europe has been a long time well, in peace. We have a, lot, a very long period of peace with, of course, problems, not always permanent, but, but not a war like is happening now has not happened for, 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 for a generation. Nobody remembers of, of the current generation's war. It's something abstract and suddenly it's there. And it's so, so hideous that you don't want to see it. You don't want to face it. But alas, it's there and it's continuing. Even if you don't do anything, it will spread. And, and you will keep fighting. And so you have to days. choose. It, and, and there is no other way, alas. You will have to choose and, and, and reality will strike. I hope, of course, that Ukrainian offensive will work. I don't know. It's, it's, I'm not a military expert. Uh, 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 but that is, that is going to help, but it's not going to solve the problem. What are your plans uh, in future for Ukraine, but also for you, for, for the liberal world and well, for politics? Uh, in Belgium, we are facing, uh, in a year, we have elections. Uh, these elections will also regional, national, uh, communal, all at the same, and European, all at the same time, eh, almost, eh, the, the regional, all a few months later. Um, Democracy in Belgium and liberalism is under pressure by extremist parties. Uh, they gain traction because there is a lot of, there is discontent. And also there you have to face the discontent. You have to see why people are, are what, why are they angry? You have to also listen to them more and sometimes take into account that you're doing mistakes, which now Alas, it's not happening enough. For example, with the, the, the nuclear question uh, and the nuclear centrals in Belgium that uh, we spoke about that are uh, planned to be closed except two maybe, 70% uh, of Belgians, being it Polonians, Flemish, whatever, they say this is a very bad idea. Everybody knows we have all seen People are not stupid. They know what, with, with what happened with Ukraine, the dependence of Russia. You cannot be dependent of energy for that because energy is, is, is your wealth, is your economy. If you don't have an economy anymore and you have to pay five times the price for energy and importing and then also supporting a, a, a country that's waging war against a partner of us and soon against us, who knows? That is totally, that is stupid. Everybody knows it and yet we still are doing that. And, and there are difficult choices, well, not difficult choices, but for I don't know why, but these choices are not made, although there is a lot of, well, consensus not to close those uh, nuclear centrals. And, and these elections are going to be very important. The European elections are going to be very important. We see in certain countries um, that parties in the, the polls stand to gain a lot of votes. Parties that are not officially pro-Russian, but who say, okay, we need appeasement, we need, uh, you know, that there is, there is, uh, there was in the past, uh, Front National, who was, uh, uh, had good relations with, with uh, Putin. Uh, we had here in Belgium, uh, Philippe de Winter, who was uh, uh, visited and, and to Russia and, and, and uh, went to Assad to visit Assad, uh, uh, the, where Russia, of course, we know also their involvement there. So that is very worrisome. So what will you do in all the situation? Uh, what's, what's your plan? Our plans are to be very active, to do, uh, we have a lot of events coming up, and to uh, build a bridge between the, the old, the, the, the open VLD, MR and other liberal forces that are, because there are more liberals for the moment than there are liberals in political parties. It is like that. Oh, you mean the more liberals? Yes, there are more people that say I'm liberal, but for the moment are not. Represented. Uh, so. Yeah, who don't feel represented by the, the. And we try to, to bridge that gap 
by uh, doing events and, and we will also uh, um, make a charter with political points that we would like that the Liberal Party support or not and we will put that charter to the, the MR and Open VLD and see which points they like or not and, and, and push for that and, and, and so uh, a bit like you also, a bit, well it is pushing on the agenda um, and of course we will always uh, if you have an event or something we always uh, will support it even more now because I, I didn't know about that the Russians that are, I really missed that that they are apparently now more active that is very worrisome and and uh, yeah we need to do something about that thank you Carlo it was a pleasure it was very insightful and uh, thank you for your support Thank let's you very much. Thank you for your courage and, <laughs> and what you're all doing. I, I mean, this is really, this is uh, an example for how, how Europe must be. Thank you. This was Unlock Ukraine with Carlo van Grotel. And um, don't forget to subscribe for more insightful videos. Thank you very much. Bye.